Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church of Ames, Iowa. We're glad you're with us today, whether you are uh, near or far. Welcome everyone. Uh, we generally ask you to use this time to uh, open up your chat window and share a word of welcome uh, and greeting with others. A lot of you've already done that. We invite, we invite you to, uh, to do that. And uh, the way of announcements, uh, just a second. In the way of announcements, uh, the theology class meets following worship this morning. Our other classes are not meeting today. Uh, this week we have the usual schedule with the virtual coffee shop and the Lenten devotion on Thursday evenings. Uh, the trustees meet on Tuesday night this week. We are receiving the America for Christ offering through this month of March, which supports American Baptist uh, mission uh, throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. And you can send a check with just memo AFC or send one check with your pledge and just put in the memo what's for your pledge and what's for America for Christ. And we uh, appreciate your continuing support for our ministries. Uh, you can mail checks to the church or you can use the PayPal uh, option uh, from our website. Uh, next Sunday, you got to get up early next week. It's an hour earlier with the time change. You either get up earlier or just roll over in bed and, and grab your phone. But we, you know, probably best is to go ahead and go ahead and get up um, to join us for worship next Sunday. Um, and kind of looking ahead, we will have an outdoor in-person sunrise service um, at the Stegemuller's house, Stegemuller's yard. Um, we'll give more details on the time and parking instructions and so forth. But that just uh, looking ahead to put on your calendar a chance to gather in person for worship on Easter Sunday morning. I invite you to join now for our call to worship. We gather to celebrate the awesome and expansive love of God. We once were lost, but now are found. We gather to sing praises to the one who reaches out to us when we are in the depths of despair. We once were lost, but now are found. We gather to give thanks to the one whose love has found us. We once were lost, but now are found. Let us worship the Lord. Please join as we sing Amazing Grace.
Our scripture reading this morning uh, is three different parables from Luke chapter 15. It's a rather lengthy reading, so we called in uh, a group of youth readers to lead us this morning. Uh, they'll be reading the first two parables uh, in their first reading and the third parable in the second reading. These are stories of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Please join us. Uh, please join in prayer. Your response is hear our prayer, O Lord. God of wisdom, we confess before you the foolishness of our ways and our failure to follow you in your paths of right relationships. We have gone astray. We feel lost. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We have upheld our own interests first to the detriment of others. We have failed to be generous with the poor and our efforts to bring about justice have been half-hearted. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash us clean from our sin and help us to live more faithfully as your servants. Hear our prayer, O Lord. We praise you that when we have strayed, you seek after us. We are filled with gratitude that when we are weak, you carry us like that lost lamb. And we stand amazed at your mercy and forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Amen. Thank you to our readers this morning. Jesus has been encountering some criticism from those who don't like the company he's been keeping. Why are you hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, some of the Pharisees asked. Now, the Pharisees, they were doing their best to lead upright lives and provide a moral example for the community. Meanwhile, Jesus is associating with the questionable characters, and as far as they were concerned, he is condoning sin. Well, in response, Jesus tells some stories. This was his go-to teaching method. I mean, he could have just made statements. He could have just handed out take-home meetings. He could have gathered a large group of followers together and then said, don't be a jerk. Or he could have gathered a bunch of people together and just say, have compassion for others. Or God's love is really big. But instead, Jesus tells stories. And the parables are so much deeper, so much more engaging, containing multiple facets and forcing us to think about them and chew on them for a while. In this case, Jesus tells three, count them, three parables about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. First, Jesus says, who among you, if you had a hundred sheep, wouldn't leave the 99 and go looking for that one sheep that had wandered away? Or what woman, if she had 10 coins and lost one, wouldn't just turn the house upside down looking for that one coin and then call her friends and neighbors and tell them, hey, let's celebrate, I found my lost coin. Who among us wouldn't do that? Well, to be real honest, none of us would do that. That makes no sense. Why would you leave 99 sheep alone and unprotected to go look for one lost lamb who's probably been devoured by wolves by now anyway? What does Jesus mean? Who wouldn't do this? And I have to tell you, if I called the neighbors and said, hey, let's have a party. I found my missing $5 bill. They would think something was wrong with me. I mean, more than they probably already think that. Well, to put this in a different kind of setting, imagine Jesus telling a story like this. Who among you, if you were teaching organic chemistry and had a student in danger of failing, would not cancel all of your appointments and go seek out that student and find them in the dormitory and pull an all-nighter 
tutoring that student the night before the test. And when that student makes a B plus, will you not run to all your departmental colleagues and say, come party with me. That clueless kid is going to pass organic. Who would do that? It doesn't work that way. You know, it occurs to me that the shepherd with the 100 sheep had to notice that one was missing. I mean, these sheep are not going to line up and count off for you, and they're not tagged with barcodes. A field with 99 sheep, I mean, that looks a lot like a field with 100 sheep. So this is a very attentive shepherd, a shepherd who's intimately connected to the flock. The shepherd searches and finds the sheep and carries it back on his shoulders. It's a very tender image. To this shepherd, each sheep, each little lamb matters. It's a picture of God's love for every one of us, a love that seems to us to really not make good sense, so much so that it can be offensive. Julia Ward Howe once asked Senator Charles Sumner to use his influence to intercede on behalf of a constituent who desperately needed help. And the senator responded, Julia, these days I've become so busy and so involved in so many different things that I no longer have time to direct my attention to the concerns of individuals. And Julia Ward Howe replied, Senator, that's quite remarkable. Even God hasn't reached that stage yet. God cares for each one of us. Now, did you ever stop to think about the 99 sheep who were not lost? And did you ever wonder what those 99 sheep thought about this whole episode? Did they think, wow, if I ever get lost, it's great to know that the shepherd is going to come looking for me. Well, in this parable, we might associate the Pharisees who were questioning Jesus with the 99 sheep who stayed put, even while the shepherd was away. They were not the ones who were lost. They were the ones who did not stray, the ones who did not get into trouble. And no, they did not think about the shepherd looking for them if they were lost because they could not imagine themselves to be in that situation. Those who question Jesus' behavior and choice of friends we're not concerned with individuals, certainly not individuals who are different than they were, because they had put the world into neat little categories. They were in, tax collectors were out. They were good, those who didn't measure up to their idea of respectability were bad. They were the ones God really loved, those who couldn't do as many spiritual calisthenics as they could, God may not have time for. The problem is that they failed to see their own lostness. They failed to understand that we can all be lost at times and that we all stand in need of God's grace. And then Jesus told a third parable, kind of a you know, one, two, three punch. And this parable was about a father with two sons. The younger son asked for his inheritance. Now, who does that? That's like saying, that's tantamount to saying, I wish you were already dead. But astonishingly, the father gives the son his part of the inheritance. He leaves home, goes to a far country, blows all the money on who knows what. The text says immoral living. Out of money, out of options, he hires himself out to a farmer and finds himself feeding pigs. And he's so hungry that he wants to eat what the pigs are eating. At that point, he comes to himself, as the scripture says. He comes to his senses. He's pretty much burned bridges back home, but nevertheless, he decides to return to his father, hoping that he can work as a servant. I mean, that would be way better than where he was right now. And as the boy returns home, he rehearses in his head a speech about not deserving to be a son and 
hoping maybe he could be a hired hand for his father. But before he even makes it home, his father sees him walking down the road. The father throws off all propriety. He runs down the road. He gives the boy a big hug. And before the son can say that rehearsed speech, the father tells his servants to get ready to have a big party because the son of mine was lost and now is found. Now, if you're keeping score, there were 100 sheep and one was lost. The shepherd goes to seek out that one. There were 10 coins, one was lost, and the woman searches until she finds that one. So we've gone from 100 to 10 to two sons. Two sons and one was lost. Except I think that maybe there were two sons and two were lost. The older son is dutifully working out in the fields. He heads back to the house and lo and behold, he hears music playing. People are laughing. He smells steaks on the grill. There's a party. He asks someone what is going on and he's told your brother has come home. Your father is throwing a huge celebration. The older brother doesn't take that news very well. He was angry. The way that his brother had acted was disgraceful. He'd about broken the old man's heart and he'd certainly embarrassed the family. Everything had been given to him and he had just squandered it all. You don't reward that kind of behavior. The last thing he needed was a party. And so the older brother refused to go. But just as the father had run down the road to meet the younger son, he goes out to the older son. He pleads with him to come in and join the celebration. But the older brother will have nothing to do with it. For the older brother, the father's grace was offensive. He says to his father, all this time I've been working like a slave and you never threw a party for me. Somehow, he has experienced home as like being a slave, not as being a treasured member of the family. Both of the sons were lost, and we can all be a little lost at times, even when we are right at home. Jesus' message to the Pharisees was, you are invited, you are welcome. The only way to miss the party is by choosing not to come, by letting your jealousy or animosity or disdain for grace extended to others keep you away. I will always welcome you. The only prize of admission is to welcome these others. We sang the hymn Amazing Grace a few moments ago. It's a powerful hymn because it says, I once was lost, but now am found. It doesn't say you are lost and I am found. And it's powerful because it speaks of continuing to live and to grow in God's grace. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. His grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. Now, a lot of us could talk about dangers and toils and snares that we have experienced. Plenty of those in this past year. And some are experiencing that just now. Our experience of God involves a lifetime of living. And if we're honest, there are those times when we can feel lost. Maybe a little lost and maybe a lot lost that God is always there to lead us home and to welcome us home. A rabbi asked his students, when is it at dawn that one can tell the darkness from the light? One student replied, when I can tell a goat from a donkey. No, said the rabbi. Another said, when I can tell a palm tree from a fig. No answer the rabbi again. Well, then what is the answer? His students pressed him. 
only when you look into the face of every man and every woman and you see a brother and a sister. Only then have you seen the light. All else is still darkness. The Pharisees were offended that Jesus spent time with those that they considered to be undesirables. But to Jesus, they were brothers and sisters. They were lost sheep. They were missing treasure. They were sons and daughters who had gone astray. We serve a God who loves us deeply and who seeks us out. Like a shepherd looking for a lost lamb, like a woman searching for a lost coin, like a father who embraces both the child who has wandered far away and the child who has been there the whole time but was lost. And when we come home, God celebrates. Amen.
Let's join together in prayer. Holy and grace-filled God, we give you thanks for the gift of life and for the blessings of this life, for family and friends and abundant love. We confess that we can feel lost sometimes, oh God. And some of us are feeling a little lost just now. Lead us, Lord, through those dangers and toils and snares that we face. Walk beside us through the challenges and struggles, through times of exhaustion, through those bleak places. Lead us back to you and to your abundant love. Be with those who are filled with sadness, with those who cannot sleep, with those who are longing for peace, with those who are crying out for justice, and be with all those who have wandered far from your love. And Lord, when we have wandered far from your best intentions for our lives, we pray that you might guide us to your welcoming arms. Guide us back to the music and dancing and celebration, for we can be easily lost, and only you, O oh God, can find us. We lift our prayers this morning on behalf of those who are facing some of those difficult times. We pray for Jack, for Maddie, for Lindsay, for Bill, for Greg's mother, for Stephanie's father, for Beth's father. We pray for Jason's friend, Paul, who has lost his dad, for Dan in hospice, we pray for Aunt Liz and for so many who have the virus or are concerned and living in fear that they're about to contract it. We give thanks, Lord, for your continuing love that just as you go after that one little lamb, you hear all of our prayers and you love us and want the best for us. So we ask all of this with praise and with expectation. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be celebrating communion this morning. Hopefully you've got uh, bread and uh, juice on hand. As we uh, prepare for that, we sing together the communion song, Come to the Table of Grace.
This morning, we gather together at God's table. And this is a table where we are all welcome. It's like that huge table where there's always room to pull up another chair. And whether you have uh, been home and been there for this meal uh, all along, or whether you've wandered far away and you're coming back home, you are welcome here. Let's pray together. Oh God, we come to this table of grace, celebrating your great love shown us in Jesus Christ. We give thanks for the bread and for the cup, symbols of that great love. We pray that this might be for us spiritual food to nourish us in our spirits that we may serve you, extending that grace to all of your children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life, take and eat. After the supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he poured it and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing, take and drink. The gospel accounts say that after the meal, Jesus and the disciples sang a hymn and then departed. Of course, if we've, if we've mentioned in previous months, we've already departed, but we're going to sing uh, the hymn, um, and we'll sing this as our benediction. Uh, we'll sing, Bless Be the Tie That Binds. And again, um, when we're meeting in the sanctuary, our custom is to join hands. So where you are at home, uh, you might join hands if someone who's there, or if not, uh, just extend hands uh, symbolically. Yeah. 